This meeting is being recorded. All right, everyone. We have finished one chapter of our exploratory journey into the realm of universal ideas, the pursuit of truth, beauty, and goodness from a variety of, of, of different angles, scientific, artistic, historic, political. So what better way to leave off of the 12 week journey into economics at the end of our delusion by uh, the modern Platonist master himself, the recently deceased, physically at least, uh, Lyndon LaRouche, than by going into the mind that made so much possible that actual, that both actual created potentials, created possibilities, and then helped people actualize those creative possibilities and live into that space that uh, we were not supposed to move into over the course of the last 2000 years. And of course, I'm speaking about Plato himself. So we are now opening up on, on, on the suggestion of Dr. Quan Le. We have decided we're basically going to enter into a very important dialogue um, called the Theotetus. Quan will be manning the ship going forward in the coming weeks, including tonight, uh, as Cynthia and I are going to be departing for uh, several weeks, five, six weeks um, on, a, on a speaking tour, uh, touching in, into Ireland, Europe, uh, Asia. Yeah. Where did, where did, I, where did, where did I cut off? You, uh, Matt can't pretty, hear you. Can you hear now? Pretty much at the start. Yeah, yeah just just restart. Okay, from from the start, from the moment I said like welcome, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's oh, be better. Damn, I was because... waxing so eloquent too, guys. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, You're on a wait for wait for Cynthia. Yeah. yeah it, no, yeah. no, keep. Oh, there she is. Just from the beginning, it would be a, <laughs> it would be a rapture for everyone. So. <laughs> All right, welcome everyone for this week's Rising Tide Foundation reading workshop. We have just finished a multiple week, actually three month voyage into the mind of a modern platonic humanist named Lyndon LaRouche, who did some incredible work. And this essay was, was called Economics at the End of Our Delusion, where we journeyed through the interconnectedness of science, history, polit politics, philosophy, geopolitics, economics, and recognized, I think, I, I would imagine pretty pretty concisely how all of these things are different sides of the same oneness, the same uh, thing. So what better way, uh, Quan, Cynthia, myself, we're talking about, well, what, what would we go into next as part of this voyage of discovery into the realm of universals? And so Quan proposed, uh, the, at the very least, the first part of a trilogy written by the man himself, Plato, uh, from over 2,000 years ago, um, called the Theotetus on the subject of knowledge, but also on the subject of questions that touch on transcendentals, the idea of incommensurables, the idea both of the, um, the, the dance between math and physics, which we're going to come to see in coming weeks ahead. And uh, before Quan, I'm going to ask him to say maybe a word or two as well in terms of how he selected this and, and where what is important about Plato and the Theotetus? I would just like to say that Cynthia, myself, for the next four weeks, will be voyaging uh, on a speaking tour of Europe, starting with Ireland, then going to to uh, Switzerland, and a few other stops in between um, before we head off to Asia, where Quan will join us on a, on a certain project. And um, Quan will be leading for the next three weeks, at least, uh, these weekly readings. You might not necessarily see us. It'll be in the middle of the night for us. Um, so I'm I'm, that'll be uh, that's great. It's great that Quan is is manning the ship there. Um, Quan, so before we we start, uh, you have any uh, thoughts to sort of tune our minds to uh, to the Theotetus? Yeah, I would like five minutes to give a short introduction, if you want. Please. Hmm. Okay, uh, the Theotetus is a very important dialogue. If there's only one dialogue to be chosen after the Republic that Plato wrote when, when he was 52 years old, it would be the theaters because Plato wrote the theaters in 369 BCE, meaning when he was 58 years old. Uh, the chapter seven, the book seven of the Republic is the summary of the trilogy formed by the theaters, the sophist and the statement. That is hardcore epistemology because uh, in that uh, dialogue, Plato would go 
into deeper detail than the allegory of the case, because the allegory of the case, meaning the chapter seven, the book seven of the Republic, gives you a general idea. But in the, that trilogy, especially the first one about episteme, okay, episteme meaning being the Greek word for true knowledge, hence epistemological growth, he will go into really the deep details, but it's not intellectual. It's rather a, let's not forget that Plato was also a playwright, okay? So he, he was uh, skillful enough to write it in a certain manner that would uplift you to that playful exploration attitude. And when you read the, the, the dialogue, the first one, or maybe you wouldn't do the three, the, the three, but at least the first one, never forget to have that playful mindset, okay? He wouldn't say certain things. He would not say other things. He wouldn't seem to say some things, but it's rather a kind of framework for you to excite your mind to make other hypotheses from what he's offering. Because let's not suppose that everything is written in his dialogue and precisely most of Platonic uh, dialogues finish with an aporia, A-P-O-R-I-A, meaning there's no clear conclusion, but that is not the intellectual conclusion that is important, but rather the playful exploration mindset that has been excited during that uh, spiritual journey, okay? Because once again, minds is made by six layers. The first layer being the senses perception, what Plato called the shadows one, the, or ekasia, the Greek word. The second layer being the intellect, spinning words, images, and concept, Plato called ekasia two, the shadows two. The third layer being the psyche, okay, that Plato called pistis, meaning consensus or uh, conventional truth. And those three layers together, he called doxa, the opinion or the animal mind, meaning the mind that can be subjected to training and uh, instructions, meaning the mind that is subjected to manipulations, since it's the, the highest of that mind, of that animal mind is called consensus. So you can be manipulated by so-called experts since the highest layer of that doxa is created or made by the opinions of experts of your society. So the, the, the only way to escape the animal mind, which is not bad by itself, but because there's nothing wrong with the animal or with sense of perception, intellect or psyche by themselves. But what is possibly wrong or even fatal is that animal mind is not guided by the divine mind made by the three timeless form of beauty, goodness, and truth. And those are the fourth, sixth, fourth, fifth, and sixth layers of the mind, okay? Or divine mind, if you want. The fourth layer is called the soul, which is the timeless form of beauty. And not only the first layer of beauty, meaning mathematical forms, but also the higher layers of beauty, justice, uh, courtesy, kindness, uh, beauty under the forms of architecture, literature, philosophy, arts, etc. And that journey into the deeper layers of beauty will bring you to goodness, okay, precisely, agape, or the playful exploration mindset, okay? Meaning that there's no, uh, how can I say it? It's a mindset that made you capable to listen to someone not sharing your opinion, the three first layers, with, uh, how can I say it, with calm and with the capacity to see if it's a play or if that person is trying to manipulate you, okay? Because once again, the intellect is the machine to spin many possibilities. And those possibilities are not bad by themselves, but has to be put into context and has to be enlightened precisely by the timeless form of beauty, goodness. And finally, the sixth line, truth, meaning a, the, the, the level of the sage. Uh, 
for Plato, as for Confucius, the end goal of universal history, meaning peace and prosperity for all, can be achieved if the epistemological stature is perfectly matched with the social status. Okay, so for Plato, each epistemological development stage is matched with a, a political stage. So once again, you heard me talk about those things in the past, but I want to put them in a systematic manner tonight. The first line corresponds to the democratic man. And the Confucius called the democratic man, the commoner. The second stage is called the plutocratic man and Confucius called him the petty officer. The third stage is called the fake democratic man and Confucius called him the officer. And once again, if the society is truly fair, the epistemological stature matches perfectly with the social status. And when we go into the divine kingdom or the timeless kingdom, the fourth line corresponds to the lords or the ministers for Confucius and for Plato to the true democratic man. The fifth line is the aristocratic man characterized by discovery, inventivity, playful exploration, and so on. And for Confucius, it's the level of the sovereign. Sovereign in terms of politics, but epistemologically, it's also the level of the sovereign mind. Okay, this mind not only capable to resist to manipulation, and that quality is, also, is already granted at the level of the true democratic man, of the lord, of the minister, according to Confucius. But the difference with the aristocratic man or the sovereign, having a sovereign mind precisely, is that is, he's much more capable of inventivity and of creativity. And finally, the last stage, the stage of the sage for Confucius or the stage of the philosophical man or the philosopher king for Plato is the stage where the man or the woman at that level would be essentially motivated in creating more aristocratic man and more democratic man, because those two kinds of human beings are the essential ingredients for the achievement of the end goals of universal history, meaning peace and prosperity offer to all, and especially the epistemological journey offer to all. And I will take a last minute to say that Let's not forget that Socrates drawing the hemlock on February 14, 399 BCE. And the, uh, we, yeah, yeah, we know exactly the date uh, after a very uh, refined calcul historical calculation. And what is moving is that the theatetes with the sophist and the statesman are three dialogues within a group of seven dialogues, which have been uh, acted in reality, if you want, during those six weeks from January 1st, 399 BCE to February 14, 399 BCE, okay? Those uh, uh, six weeks who are now in timelessness, if I may say so. And Theatrus is about the episteme true knowledge, you Thro, e -U -T -H -Y -P -H -R -O, is about uh, piety and justice and in, on injustice too. After that, we have the sophist the day after, the state man the day after, Crito, okay, another dialogue about justice and injustice, apology of Socrates, meaning Socrates uh, giving himself uh, his own defense uh, uh, in front of the King Archon following the indictment by Melitus. Let's not forget that Socrates has been very ironically accused of being, of having corrupted the youth of Athens and uh, which is uh, quite ironical, of course. And the last one, the Phaedo on the immortality of the soul. So those seven dialogues are very special because of the time in which they were acted and uplifting them to timelessness. And within those seven dialogues, the three dialogues tackling 
Episteme, True Knowledge. And I stop here for my short introduction. That was great. Thank you. Thank you, Kwan. Um, I have sent you a, uh, a link to the reading of the, the text that we're going to begin today on our chat box, Kwan. And I was hoping you could give it a shot to, uh, to do the screen share, since you're going to be doing this for the coming weeks. Uh, might as well. Okay. Unless, so, and if, it, if, if it's you, too... Did you, send it by, did you send it by Telegram or by mail? Uh, it, you could find it in the immediate instance in the, uh, the chat box, or oh. however oh, yeah, you yeah. receive the invitations to the events um, oh, on a weekly yeah. basis. It's in that email or Substack, and you'll find a link to the, uh, the okay. text. Okay, so I see the chat box of. Uh... Yeah. Okay, cool. And it's even um, so, when you so click on that link, it'll take you to the right page that we're going to start in that book. Because I have, I'm in the chat box now, but I see no link to the text. Oh, you don't see the link to archive.org? Neither do I. No, because the the chat box of the Zoom, of course, you're talking. The about. Zoom chat box, yeah, you don't see it. Nobody sees it. Yeah. I have it. I Helene uh, has it. Huh. I, yeah, have, I, I, I see it. Okay, because I'm I the chat. I, I have Susan's message. We are ready for a play. Okay, I see it now. Yeah, okay. okay. Oh, good. Okay. okay, maybe there's a delay. Okay. And if it doesn't work, then I'll, I'll share if, if we hit too many stumbling blocks for tonight, but uh, fingers crossed. Okay, so I hope... What? Quan? Quan? It's all good. Hey, it's Warfield. Quan, are you there? He'll figure it he's out. He's, he's so smart. He'll figure it out. Now, I opened the uh, the link that you sent with the email a little bit earlier this morning while I'm having my cup of coffee and read much of the introduction to the download that I got. Cool. That, that, that's not the text. It's the introduction to the text. So, you know, that's uh, one man's opinion, let's say. Exactly. Yeah. I usually avoid the introductions because uh, they, they, they usually are, are dishonest or they try to color how I'm going to interpret the readings. But then again... Yeah. Even so, just just sitting here and reading it puts me in the right frame of mind for the cool. discussion we're having today. So, good show. It was worth doing. Uh, All I'm saying is. there is, it was easy, easy to find. Nice. Yeah. What happened is that I opened the text, but I think that I just got out of Zoom when I opened the text. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so, do you want me to do the share for today, and then you and I can do a little uh, practice run in the coming days? I think that would be uh, a good idea not to be too clumsy on screen for now. Okay. All right. Can people see that? Yep. All right. So what, what characters do we have here? We have uh, somebody named Terpsio, Euclides. Um, I'm sure we're going to have a Socrates pop in, and we're definitely going to have a Theotetus pop in. Um, so we need a few readers. Um Ooh, Paul, uh, you want to be uh, a character today? I'll happily be a character, yes. All right, let's put you uh, on the, you want to be the uh, Theotetus? Theotetus, okay, which means area, doesn't it? I don't know. Yeah, look, I seem to remember that in the reference I just made to the introduction. Anyway, huh. Theotetus, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so. Okay. Oops, Daisy, hang on, I, I need it bigger than that. Yeah, I'm going to make it bigger, don't worry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 in, the, in, the, in the introduction, uh, you will have Euclides and Tertians talking about and own the Theotetus, okay? Because the year there was in 369 BCE, okay? Theotetus would die because uh, he, would, he suffered from a disease uh, he got on the battlefield. And when he talked to Socrates, it was 30 years earlier, in 399 BC, when Socrates uh, was going to die by drinking, drinking, sorry, the hemlock. Mm. So you have a flash for words, and after you can have a flashback to 399 BC. Cool. 
Who would who would like to be uh, Euclides? I would. All right, Bruce is Euclides. Uh, who wants to be? Ter- I could be Terps. I'll be I'll be Terpsio. Um, I don't think Euclides and Terpsio are going to be in for very long, but that's okay. And who wants to be Socrates? Is he on longer? I'll be Socrates. All right, Bruce is Socrates. Who's going to be uh, Euclides? Uh, I can be I can be Euclides because he won't talk for about uh, thirty seconds. So <laughs> all right, okay, cool. Let's do it. Okay, let's let's begin. Sure. Okay, just now, Tercion, a long time ago from the country. Uh, it's Tercion now to talk. Uh, this is where you've just said, have you only just come from the country, Terpsio, or have yeah, you been here yeah, some time? Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Okay. Uh, I, cons- I have a, a slightly different version, but it, it, it's, it's the same. Oh, okay. A considerable time. And what is more, I have been looking for you in the Agora and began to wonder that I could not find you. That's because I wasn't anywhere in the city. Where were you then? On going down to the harbor, I met Theotitis as he was being carried out of Corinth from the army camp to Athens. Alive or dead? Alive, barely. He's in a bad way, also from some wounds. But the outbreak of the illness in the army affects him more. The the dysentery, you mean? Yes. What a hero we we seem likely to lose if what you say is true. Beautiful and good, Tosion, and you know, I was listening even now to some people highly praising his conduct, his conduct in the battle. In the battle, I hear of a footnote saying the Battle of Corinth, 392 BC, between Corinthians and Argives and the Spartans. Um, there is nothing strange in that. It would be much more surprising if you were not what they describe. But how is it that he did not stop here at Megara? He was pressing for home, though I beg and advise him, but he wasn't willing. And then, when I sent him on his way, on my way back, I recall with amazement how prophetically Socrates had spoken about him as well as different things. My impression is that Socrates met him shortly before his death, when Theotetus was a lad, and on the basis of his association and conversation with him, expressed great admiration for his nature, And when I came to Athens, he narrated to me the speeches of his conversation with him. They are well worth hearing. And he said there was every necessity that he become renowned if he reached maturity. And he spoke truly, as the result seems to show. But what was the subject of the conversation? Could you give me a full account of it? Oh, no, by Zeus. Not at any rate straight off from memory, but I did write down reminders just as soon as I returned home. And later, in recalling it in my, at my leisure, I proceeded to write them up. And as often as I returned to Athens, I questioned Socrates repeatedly about whatever I hadn't remember. And then on my return here, I made corrections. So pretty nearly the entire speech has been written by me. True, I I heard you say so before. Indeed, I intended always to ask you to let me see it, but up to this time I have delayed in doing so. But what prevents us from going through it now? Anyhow, I want to rest, having come all the way from the country. But of course, I myself escorted Theotetus up to Erineos, so I wouldn't take a rest without pleasure. Well, let's go. And while we're resting, the boy will read. For my own part, too, I may see that I that as I went with the Atidas as far as the fig tree, I should not be sorry to rest. Let us, therefore, go to my house, and the boy shall read to us while we are taking our ease. They enter... Just, oh, sorry, by all means. Oh, wait, that was you. I just read you. Oh, my God, I'm so sorry. Oh, that's okay. Uh, you should have said a good suggestion or something like that. And Euclides would say, here's the book, Thersion. 
And I wrote the speech now on those terms, not with Socrates narrating them to me as he did, but with Socrates conversing with those with whom he said he conversed. He said they were the Jumiter, Theodorus, and Theatetus, in order that the narrations between the speeches might not cause trouble in the writing. Whenever either Socrates spoke about himself, for example, and I said, or and I spoke, or in turn about whatever answer he consented or he refused to agree, it's for these reasons that I removed things of this sort and wrote it as if he were conversing mm. with them. And mm. not without good precedent, Euclides. Well, boy, take the book and read. And now but, we enter into the main of the conversation. It's great. It's really like st set with stage direction, right? And directives to the actors to perform it. That's good. Well, gentlemen, I remind everyone that Plato was also a playwright. Absolutely. That's a very important point. Action. 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 <laughs> Seen as at Athens. If my Theodore, I cared more for Sereni, Serene, and the state of affairs there, I should ask about them and the people. If you have any young men in your town who are interested in geometry or any other branch of learning, but I will not. I have a great regard for them, but more for those here. And therefore, I am the more anxious to know what young men we have who are expected to make a figure. To this subject, then, I not only direct my own attention as far as I can, but I make inquiry of others whenever I see our youths willing to attend their instructions. Now, you attract to yourself more pupils than anyone else, and with good reason for you are held in esteem on other grounds besides your skill in geometry. So now, if you have met with anyone worthy of special mention, it would give me great pleasure to hear it. So we need, we need a, a Theodora. Theodorus is um, the name I've encountered. But Theodore, who would like to be Theodore? Theodore. Yeah. This is the Greek. You want me to try? Yeah, uh, go, go. Yeah, yeah, Susie, do it. Sorry, Susie. Then, Socrates, it will be worth, no, it will be as much worth my while to tell you as yours to hear what a promising young fellow I have met with among your citizens. If indeed he were good looking, I should feel some scruple at giving a description of him, lest a certain person should suspect I am a I am an admirer of his, but as it is, and you will pardon what I am going to say, he is not handsome, but rather like you in his broad flat nose and the external contour of the eyes. Only he has these features less strongly marked than you have. So I have no fear in speaking of his other merits, for I assure you that of all I ever met with, and I have conversed with very many, I never found anyone so favored by nature and of so good a disposition. Indeed, he is surprisingly so. For that one who was quick at learning to a degree that is seldom equaled should also be peculiar, peculiarly gentle. And beside those qualities, as brave as anyone, I should not have supposed was a thing possible nor do I observe such results of education in any young men. No, your quick pupils, like our friend, who have their wits about them and good memories, are usually hasty in their tempers. They are carried along in an unsteady course, like boots without ballast, boats without ballast, and grow up impulsive rather than of a manly decision. While your dullards, on the other hand, come reluctantly to their lessons and with nothing in their heads but forgetfulness. But our young friend comes so smoothly and without the least hitch, with such success too, to his books and problems and with the greatest gentleness 
like oil that makes no sound as it runs, that one feels surprised that one so young can perform his duties in so pleasing a way. You give a promising account, but tell me further, who of our citizens is his father? Who am I reading? Uh, the Theo. Theo. Theodoros. Okay. I have heard his name, but don't recollect it. However, here he is between two friends coming this way. It seems that he and some of his companions have just been getting rubbed with oil in the outer portion. And now I suppose they have been anointed and are coming this way. See now if you recognize him. I know him. Tis the son of Euphronius of Sunium, a character much as you describe your friend and of general good repute. If I mistake not, he left a very large property, but the name of the youth, I don't know. His name, Socrates, is Theotetus. As for his fortune, I am afraid certain guardians of his have not improved it. Yet even in liberality and money matters, one can't help admiring him, Socrates. Tis a generous fellow you describe. Do oblige me by asking him to take a seat here by me. That shall be done. Theotetus, come here and speak to Socrates. Yes, pray do, Theotetus, if only that I may get a good sight of my own likeness, for Theodore tells me I have a face like yours. Now, suppose each of us had a lute, and he said that, and he said they were both tuned to the same pitch. Should we at once believe him, or should we have considered whether the man who says says so, the man who says so skilled or should we have considered whether the man who says so skilled in music? We should have considered. And if we found out that he was, we should believe him. Or if ignorant of music, we should put no faith in him. True. So now, I suppose, if we care at all about our faces being alike, we must consider whether the person who says so is conversant with the lines or not. I think he is that. Has then Theodore any skill as a portrait painter? Not that I know of. What? Do you mean to say he's not even a geometer? Oh, he is that, of course, Socrates. Well, is he also versed in astronomy and abstract calculation and music and such other kinds of knowledge as belong to general education? He appears to me to be so. Then if he says we are alike in any part of our bodies, either in praise or disparagement, we are by no means bound to listen to him. Perhaps not. But what if he were to praise the mind of either of us in respect of virtue and wisdom? Would it be not be worthwhile for the party who heard the remark to take a little trouble to examine the, persons, the person praised and for him to exhibit himself freely and readily? Certainly it would, Socrates. Certainly it would. Somewhere it would. I'm so sorry. I'm so <laughs> sorry. I hit the wrong thing. Uh, no, further down. Oops. There it is. Keep going. Yeah. Give me a little more. Yeah. There we go. Certainly it would. Then, my dear Theotetus, it is high time for you to exhibit and for me to observe. For I assure you, though Theodore has spoken favorably to me of very many, both strangers and citizens, he never praised any one of them as he praised you. It might be right then to do as you say. Only I am afraid that he was not in earnest when he spoke of me thus. That is not the, that is not Theodore's way. No, don't try to evade your promise by pretending that our friend here was only joking, or we may have to produce him in court as a witness. Whatever he says of you, no one will indict such a man for perjury. So take courage and abide by your agreement. <laughs> well, I suppose I must do so if you think it right. Then tell me, you learned from Theodore, I presume, something about geometry? I do. And also something of astronomy, music, and figures? I endeavor to do so, certainly. Well, and so do I, my child, from him at all events, if not from others, whom I may suppose to have fair knowledge of these subjects. Still, though, I have a fair acquaintance with them. There is one little matter which I am in doubt about and which I should like to consider with you in the present company. And now tell me, is not learning the becoming wiser in what one learns? Of course. And it is in wisdom that the wise are wise. Yes. 
Now, is there any difference between this and science? Uh, what do you speak? Wisdom. If we have accurate knowledge on any subjects, are we not also wise in them? Of course. Then science and wisdom are the same? Yes. This then is precisely the point that I am perplexed about and unable to realize as I should wish in my own mind what accurate knowledge is. Possibly now we may describe it. What say you? Which of you will be the first to speak? He who gives me a wrong answer and gets wrong always shall be donkey, as the boys say who play at ball and have to sit down, while he who gets through the examination without a mistake shall be king over us and impose on us any subject on which he may choose that we may give answers. Why are you silent? I hope, Theodore, it is not I that am acting the churl from fondness of discussion and in my eagerness to make you converse and uh, so become friends and have a chat with each other. Uh, Susan, it's you, your turn. Theodore. Yeah, Theodore. Sorry. That, Socrates, would be anything but churlish, but desire one of these young men to give you a reply. For I am not much used to this sort of conversation, and I am not of an age either to become used to it. But it will just suit our young friends here, and they will greatly improve. For it is quite true that youth has a capacity for improving in anything. So as you begin, put the question to Theotetus, and don't let him off. You hear Theotetus, what Theodore says? And I suppose you will not care to disobey him, as indeed it is not permitted for a younger man to do what a man learned in such matters gives his commands. So let us have a good, clear answer without stint. What does science seem to you to be? Well, I suppose I must reply, Socrates, since you and the rest desire me. For, of course, if I do make some mistake, you will set me right. Oh, certainly. That is, if we are able. Well, then, I think that what one can learn from Theodore may be called sciences, geometry, and those you just named, and again, shoemaking and the trades of the other craftsmen, all and each of them are nothing else than knowledge. Like a generous and free-handed man, my friend, when asked for one, you offer many, and various, for simple. What do you mean by that, Socrates? It has no meaning, perhaps, but what I think I intended to say, I will explain. When you speak of a cobbler's art, do you mean by it anything else than the science of manufacture of shoes? Nothing else. Well, when you speak of carpentry, is it anything but the science of manufacturing wooden implements? My reply is the same in this case, too. Then in both, you can find your answer to that of what each art is the science. Yes. But my, but my theatetus, the question asked was not this, of what things knowledge is the science, nor how many sciences there are. For it was not with any wish to count them that we asked, but to get a clear knowledge about science, what it is in the abstract. Or is there nothing at all in what I say? Indeed, you say very rightly. Well, now then consider well what I'm going to remark. Supposing a person should ask us about some commonplace and obvious thing, for instance, uh, what is clay? Should we not appear ridiculous if we answered him, clay is the clay of the potters and also of the porcelain makers and of the brick makers likewise? Perhaps we should. In the first place, I presume, in supposing that the questioner would understand what clay was from our answer, clay is clay, adding either such as the image makers use or any other artist you please. Or do you believe that a man understands the name of a thing if he does not know what the thing itself is? By no means. Then no one who does not know what science means can understand either the science of shoes. He cannot. And again, whoever is ignorant what science is does not comprehend the knowledge of leather or any other trade. That is so. 
And the answer is absurd when a man is asked, what is knowledge? If he gives in reply, the name of some trade for, for his answer is confined to the knowledge of some particular subject, but he was not asked that. So it seems. Thus, when he might, I suppose, have answered in a common way, and in brief, he goes a roundabout way that has no end to it. For instance, in the question about clay, it was obvious, surely, and simple to reply that earth mixed up with any fluid it would be clay, and you need not concern yourself as to whose clay it is. Yes, it appears easy enough now, Socrates, when you put it thus, but your question seems like one which lately presented itself to us when we were talking. I and your namesake here, Socrates. What was that now, Theotetus? Uh, may I interrupt here? Yes, of course. Okay. Uh, I want to interrupt here because here is a very big nexus, okay? Because in the, in the next pages, uh, Socrates will use uh, ex an example from arithmetic and mathematics, but the, the, the topic is deeper because uh, here is a reference to the dialogue Concratilus. And in the dialogue Concratilus, C-R-I-T-Y-L-U-S, the question was, when you give a name to something or to someone, is that name simply a social convention or that name is reflecting the deep reality of that thing or of that person, okay? Why I stop you guys here? Because uh, that is the nexus of the debate between uh, nominalism and essence essentialism, okay? And, and Platonism, and every classical traditions is at the core of what is called essentialism, meaning that if you have the right language, that right language would offer you names and labels that are, if not directly a reflection of the reality of a phenomenon, but uh, will give the essence of that phenomenon. Okay, mm -hmm. so here, but we have the, you know that the uh, the kingdom of Doxa and of Episteme is separated by what Plato called the dividing line, and that is precisely uh, a top on that dividing line. Okay, is it pure nominalism? If it's pure nom nominalism, we can stop at the psyche. Okay, let's not forget that the psyche is a, is the epistemological level given by the consensus of experts. But if it's not pure nominalism, so we have to go deeper into something more universal. Okay, so I took the liberty to stop you guys here because in the next pages, there will be a quite uh, lofty discussions about numbers and irrational numbers and so on. And those things are interesting, but always keep in mind that that mathematical discussion has a deeper intention about nominalism versus going to the timeless form of beauty, goodness, and truth. And mathematics, precisely, is the first layer of beauty in which we can be stuck if we don't go deeper. Juan, thank you. That was very helpful for me, who I'm about to try to you know, give voice to Socrates' dialogue here. Thank you. And yeah, Juan, well, can I right. ask a uh, Can I ask what, a question? Of course, Oops. of course. Of course, since I take the liberty to interrupt you guys, you can interrupt me, of course. <laughs> okay, I'm wanting to clarify and restate in my own words what you said. And I think you said that there is a debate between nominalism and essentialism. Yes, all if correct? you prefer. Exactly, exactly. And essentialism is the core of all classical traditions. And what I mean by classical tradition is the our traditions having the pretension to say that at the deepest of our being, they are the timeless form of beauty, goodness, and truth. Okay, okay. Because I would agree that a name is meant to imply more deeper understanding of what the essence of that thing is. So that's in agreement with essentialism? Yes, exactly. Okay. And that's, and, 
And if you want to go deeper in that, you can read the dialogue Cratylus, C-R-A-T-Y-L-U-S. Who wrote that? Uh, Plato. Plato. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, ba -dum -bum -bum. What was that now, Theotetus? Hey, that's right? my line. I know. Yeah. What was that now, Theotetus? <laughs> Theodore here was writing down for us some facts about the powers of numbers and showing us that a rectangle composed of a three foot and a five foot line, three by five, is not geometrically commensurable by the one foot line. And so he went on taking examples one by one up to the 17 foot line and at that he stopped. The idea then occurred to us that as these powers seemed indefinitely numerous, we should try to comprehend them under some one general term by which we might describe all of this kind. Did you then find such a term? I think we did, but consider it also yourself. Tell me then. We divided all number into two kinds. That which could be resolved into an equal number of factors we compared to a figure square in form and called it both a quadrangular and equal sided. And very appropriately too. Well, the intervening numbers such as three and, I was about to say 148, but three and five, and all such as cannot be resolved into equal factors, but can only become either more taken fewer times or less taken more times. And so do as you will, must ever be enclosed by one side that is greater than another side. This kind of numbers we compared to the oblong form and called it long number. Very good indeed. But what next? All the lines which make up an equilateral rectangular superficial area we distinguished as regular and all that include a parallelogram as powers on the ground that the limit, sorry, in linear figure, they were not commensurable with those other lines, but only with the superficial squares they were equivalent to, and similarly with cube numbers. One could possibly have done better, my dear boys, so that Theodore, as it seems to be, will not be held liable to penalties of perjury. But Socrates, your question about knowledge, I am not likely to answer as readily as that about the geometrical extension and the power of number, though it seems to me that you require some such a reply. I am afraid, therefore, that if Theodore was right in the other matter, he is wrong in this. What? So, suppose that in praising you for running, he had said, I never met with any young man so good a runner and then in running a race, you had been beaten by one who was in the very prime of his strength and had no superior in speed. Do you think our friend would have praised you the less truly for that? No, I do not. But now about this knowledge, as I was saying just now, do you suppose it is a small matter to find out what it is and not rather the part of very close thinkers? Indeed, I think it is a task of quite first-rate men. Then have confidence about yourself and believe there is something in what Theodore says and endeavor by every means in your power to get information about knowledge, among other things, and the true nature of it. As far as painstaking is concerned, Socrates, it shall be found out. Come, then, as you have just given a good example of your skill, so try to imitate the answer you gave about the power of numbers. And as you comprehend them, numerous though they are, under one head. So also endeavor to call the various kinds of knowledge by some one term. I assure you, Socrates, I have many, many times undertaken the consideration of this question on hearing the answers that were brought away from you. But alas, I am neither able to convince myself that I give any satisfactory account of it, nor to hear anyone else giving it in the way that you recommend. And yet, on the other hand, I cannot altogether resign my interest in the subject. The fact is, my dear Theotetus, you are in travail. You are not empty pated, but have conceived something in that brain of yours. I, I don't know, Socrates. I only describe what I feel. And, and you mean to say, you ridiculous fellow, you have never heard that I am the son of a cross-faced old lady 
Sonarite. Well, I have heard that before now. And have you heard also that I practice the same art? Certainly not. But I can assure you I do. And don't tell of me, and don't tell of me to the other professors, for they are not aware that I have this faculty. And so, in this ignorance, they do not say this of me, but only that I am the strangest of men and drive people into perplexities. Have you heard that about me? I, I certainly have. Must I tell you the reason then? By all means. Consider now the whole case of these midwives, and you will more easily perceive my meaning. You are aware, of course, that none of them, while she is herself having a family, acts as midwife to others, but only those who are now too old to have offspring. Certainly. And the reason of this, as men say, is that Artemis, without being a mother herself, has the office of bringing children into the world. Now, she does not permit women who have never born children to act as midwives to others, because human nature is too weak to undertake the practice of anything of which it had has of which it has had no experience therefore she assigned this duty only to those who are too old to have children paying this compliment to her own likeness to them perhaps that is so then is not this not only probable but a matter of course that women who are pregnant or not pregnant are more surely known by midwives than by any others certainly and these same midwives, by giving drugs and using charms, are able to bring on the birth pains, or if they choose, to make them more endurable. Also, to cause those who are in difficult labor to give the child birth, or if it should be agreed to procure abortion of the fetus, then they can affect that. All that is true. Have you ever noticed this other office of theirs, that they are matchmakers of the greatest skill, as being very clever at forming an opinion of what kind of man and woman must consort together to produce the finest children? I certainly am not aware of that at all. And let me tell you that they pique themselves more on this than on the surgical operation. For observe, would you say it belonged to the same or to a different art, to grow and gather in the fruits of the earth, and also to know on what soil, what trees, and what seeds must be planted. Not to a different, but to the same art. Do you suppose then that in the case of a woman, the judgment in question is one art, and the bringing of the child into the world is another? Well, that doesn't seem likely. Of course not. But the fact is, it is through that dishonest traffic, which requires no skill at all, of procuring a meeting between a man and a woman, which, as we all know, is called the trade of the procurus, that your midwives, as having a proper pride, shun the practice of giving advice about marriages, fearing lest through this latter profession they should incur the odium of practicing the former. For, of course, none but real midwives are entitled to give a sound opinion on, sub, su, on such subjects. So it seems. What the midwives do then, I have said, but it is less than the part that I play, for it is not in the nature of women to bring forth sometimes mere semblances, at other times genuine offspring, and that without any means of distinguishing them, if it were so, there would be no greater or more honorable duty for midwives than to separate the true and the false. Do you not think so? I do. Uh, may I interrupt here? Sure. Okay. In the next paragraph, uh, Socrates will um, um, talk about the triangle of the epistemological development, okay? Because I talk about the axial epistemopolitical triangle, but that axial epistemopolitical triangle has three layers, okay? The axiological layers, meaning the three timeless form of beauty, goodness, and truth, and the epistemological component per se, but itself. And in the next pages, it's about precisely that, lay that epistemological layers with 
uh, it's three dimensions, okay? And Socrates would start with the core dimensions, which is myutics, okay? Myutics, M-A-I-E-U-T-I-C-S. I'm sorry to spell it because I'm never sure if I pronounce it rightly in English. So at least people know what I'm talking about. So that myutics is precisely that art of midwifery, but for the mind. And that is the first uh, major component of the epistemological triangle of the axial epistemopolitical triangle, meaning that how you would bring forth the, those timeless forms of beauty, goodness, and truth. Okay, myuritics is also called heuristics, H E U R I S T I C S, and that is the the first dimension of the epistemological uh, triangle dimension of the triangle. And the second one being hermeneutics, H-E-R-M-E-N-E-U-T-I-C-S, meaning that from the discovery of beauty, goodness, and truth, how you would give a meaning to your practical life, okay? Meaning the political dimension, but in your own personal life and not the political dimension of the state or of the city. And finally, the last one is the theory of knowledge because the theory of knowledge, once again, is the pretension of the classical tradition saying that we have in the deepest of our being beauty goodness and truth but it's not a given okay it's not a revelation you have to go through a pathway to discover them by yourself and the the the, the, the core uh, dimension of it is precisely what i said as myotics or heuristics and by using that you put it in your real life, in your everyday life, and it's called hermeneutics. You give meaning, okay? That is the meaning of hermeneutics, given, to give meaning to, to your own life, okay? On a smaller meaning, hermeneutics also uh, is a branch of theology, meaning to give uh, different meanings or interpretation to the religious text, okay? But that is the smaller understanding of hermeneutics. The bigger understanding of hermeneutics is precisely going through myotics or heuristic to reach to beauty, goodness, and truth. And by using those timeless, timeless form to give meaning to your daily life. And finally, because of it, you will truly existentially discover by yourself beauty, goodness, and truth, and not as a given by revelation. Cool. Juan, could you type that one word in the chat? It began with an N, but I can't even pronounce it. Uh, uh, but I, I would write a three, okay? Uh, well, I got uh, heuristics and hermeneutics written down. Okay, but that's amazing to be comparing this using the analogy of a midwife. Hmm. And what I was seeing in that is that we can learn to recognize the stages that others are at and to help to birth wisdom in them, mm -hmm. or at least to help some little bit in that process. Exactly. Yeah, point, Susan. Yeah. yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah, or, or to, to sense who's conceptually pregnant, who's going to conceive an idea, or who's, I, I shouldn't spoil it. I'll just. Here, we're going we're gonna to keep reading. We'll see. Oh, but it's so cool. Because, I mean, you know, don't be ignorant, stupid, and careless and end up aborting the path they are on. It's, yep. it's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's all, I, I, all it, just, it just reminds me that, uh, you know, somewhere in the recesses of memory reading, you know, metaphysics and uh, even uh, mythology, that, that idea of the birthing of knowledge. Call yeah. it a meme if you like, or a theme, but but you know that's it, as soon as um, Susan started describing it, I'm thinking, oh yes, I I remember that reference many 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 times. Uh, uh, yeah, no, that that was lovely, Juan. I really appreciate that, and the, the very idea of to conceive an idea, it it, it mm. is so rooted. We don't we use these words, and we don't think about the origins and the, and what why do we use the word conceive an idea or to have a conception? We don't think about it, but is it is entirely because of this content that we're reading right now that relates to the birthing process, the creation process, that that, that language even exists that we take for granted. 
Yes, That's and that. in lingu in, in linguistics, there is a name for that. It's called mm -hmm. empty metaphors. Mm -hmm. Why empty? Because we use them so often that we forget that they are metaphors. Mm -hmm. Right, right. The other thing about birthing, of course, is that it implies a continuity. Yes, exactly. And once again, let's not forget the aristocratic man, the man having a sovereign mind, is the man capable to create as a metaphor coming from the creation of a baby, the power given by nature to women. Hmm. I'll add to this, uh, Lincoln's use of uh, metaphors from farming and from agriculture and from livestock to his audiences because they were farmers, farmers. or the recipients of farm products in towns hmm. Or people related to farming and you could even back to Plato's time and beyond, you know, any illusion or metaphor to, you know, conception and conceiving and bringing birth. That's what humans saw every day, Constant. all day long, yeah. all around them. Yeah. The dogs, the cats, the pigs, the sheep, the cattle yep, and that's what their life was and their daughters and their granddaughters. And it, and it was obvious, you know, the cycles of life, even through winter and then the re blooming of the planet in springtime and this is these are things we have to rediscover because in our in in this reality now you know we have no those those metaphors don't mean anything to us as we're all plugged in so anyway but we can recapture those metaphors that are so fruitful and we can mm -hmm. peel off the garbage that has been layered onto them today and we can bring back the truth and the vitality that originally was in them. Amen. Amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. I, I feel a, a pregnant moment as my cue to continue. Sure. <laughs> well, my art of midwifery has all the duties attached to it, which theirs has, but it differs in this, that I deliver men and not women and look to their minds when there is anything to come from them and not to their bodies. But the chief boast of our art is this, that it can put to the test in every way and ascertain whether it is mere sham and a delusion that the ideas of the young man are giving birth to or a true and genuine sentiment. This peculiarity I grant belongs to me as well as to midwives. And I have never given birth to any wisdom. And the taunt that many have before uttered against me is quite true, that I put questions to others, but never give an answer myself on any subject from, any, from, from having nothing clever to say. Well, the reason of this is I will explain that God constrains me to play the part of midwife to others, but does not allow me to have a family myself. I am then on my own part, anything but wise, for I have no such great results to show as any offspring of my genius that has seen the light. But although those who converse with me seem at first to be in some cases, even wholly ignorant, yet all as our intercourse goes on, that is to whom the God permits it, show a marvelous improvement as both they and others imagine. And it is also evident that this improvement is not due to anything that they have ever learned from me, but comes from the many fine ideas that they have hit upon and retained in their own imaginations. But then the safe delivery of these conceptions is due to me and the God, and this is how we know it. Many here now have not been aware of our part in the matter but have thought it was all due to themselves. And so despising me in their own hearts or induced by others to do so, they have left me sooner than they ought. And thus from keeping bad company have not only brought to an untimely birth, the other notions they had conceived, but have lost from bad nursing those which I had assisted them in bringing into the world. And that because they valued mere shams and semblances more than the truth. Thus, in the end, they seem both to themselves and to others to be utterly illiterate. One of these is Aristides, the son of Lysimachus, and there are very many more. Now, 
when some person when such persons come back to me wanting me to converse with them and having recourse to all sorts of strange expedients the familiar that ever attends me prevents me from having any more to say to some of them these while it allows me to keep company with others and then they again begin to improve of themselves there is another point in which my peoples resemble uh, women in labor. They are in travail and are filled with restless longings by night and by day, even more than those of the other sex. And these labor pains, my skill can bring on or alleviate. So much then for these. But some there are, my Theotetus, who seem to me not to have any idea in them. And well knowing that they do not require my aid, I act the part of a friend in making other matches for them and to speak under favor of the god i can make a pretty good guess at the sort of teachers by whose conversation they will be benefited many of them i have made over to prodicus and many to other wise and inspired teachers if i have made a long story my good friend it was on this account i suspected that you as indeed you imagine yourself were in travail with some notion that you had conceived in your mind now, therefore, behave towards me as to the son of a midwife who himself knows something of the art and do your best to answer such questions as I may put to you. If on examining what you say, I shall consider it a mere sham and not a reality, and so try to remove and reject it, do not be savage with me as women are about their first offspring. For I can tell you, that many have shown such a temper towards me as to be quite ready to bite me when I propose to rid them of some nonsensical idea. They fancy that I am not acting kindly in doing this. They are yet very far from understanding that as no God bears any ill will to man, so I do nothing of this sort from unkindness. It is because it is not permitted me to concede falsehood or to be put out of sight of the truth. Try, therefore, Theotetus, to begin again and say what you consider knowledge to be. And don't tell me that you can't. If the God wills and you play the man, you will find yourself able. Well, Socrates, when you so encourage me to try, it would be a shame not to do one's very best to say what one has to say. I think then that if a man knows something, he has a perception of it. And so, according to my present view, knowledge is nothing else than perception. Well said, and right nobly, my boy. That is just as one ought to speak who wishes to say without any reserve what he really thinks. But come, now, let us consider the matter in common to see if our egg has a chicken in it or is a mere wind egg. Perception, you say, is knowledge. I, I do. Indeed. You seem to have delivered an opinion about knowledge that is by no means commonplace. For it is one that Protagoras also gave, though it was in a somewhat different way than he expressed the same meaning, that he expressed the same meaning. If I mistake not, he says that man is the measure of all things, of things that are, that they are so, and of non-existing things, that they are not. You have read it, I think? May I interrupt here? Hmm. Yes. Uh, here is, I interrupt you guys because Protagoras was a sophist. He was born around 490 BCE and he died 70 years later in 420 BCE. So he was more or less of the same generation than Socrates, a little bit older, okay? Uh, 20 years older than Socrates. Uh, why I interrupt you? Because in the in the bourgeois education nowadays, and I would even say maybe since the last 200 years, it's, it's, it's seen as very refined in the, uh, in the salons, okay, in the, uh, in the intellectual discussions in the bourgeois salons to say that man is the measure of all things, okay, and uh, people would, 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 would appear as very refined and very, very aristocratic by saying that and by naming Protagoras, okay, even those are capable to name Protagoras, they will win the evening, but that is precisely a very bad stuff because Protagoras, under that very refined phrase, uh, which sounds a, a little bit grandiose, man is a measure of all things, is the, is the uh, partisan 
of the lowest epistemological development, meaning that knowledge is sense perceptions, okay? So mm -hmm. I just want to, next time you would be uh, in a bourgeois salon in New York City or in Montreal and in Paris, uh, don't be, uh, don't be uh, mesmerized by uh, something like that. No, not a mo even a modern version of it, like man, is, humans are now a hackable animal. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's that's even lower. <laughs> At least, ma yeah. But I'm not afraid of the of a man is a hackable animal because it's so laughable, and man is a measure on things. It's very grandiose. It can mm -hmm. it can it can seduce you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's almost like that's almost the very definition of sophistry. Yes, exactly, uh, exactly. Sophistry mm -hmm. being the the barrier to the timeless form of beauty, goodness, and truth, which is the classical tradition. And sophistry is everything that will prevent you to go there, exactly. All the lawyers in the world. Yeah. <laughs> and, all, and, all the, and all the expedients in the world, maybe, too. Yep, yep, yep. Under the general heading of bureaucracy. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay, I have read it many times. Does he not say then, in effect, that as things appear severally to me, such as such, such they are? Does he not say then, in effect, that as things appear severally to me, such they are to me, and as they seem to you, to you they are, and both of us, I suppose, are human beings? Well, he does say so. And we may be sure that a wise man is not in the habit of talking nonsense. Now let us therefore follow him in this argument. Does it not happen sometimes when the wind blows that one, one of us feels cold, another does not, and one feels it but slightly, another very much? Certainly. Must we then on that particular occasion say that the wind is cold of itself? Or not cold, uh -huh. or or Wikipedia is trying to bust into this. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, must we accept? That's my line. <laughs> I'm just trying to make sure I know where I am, man. There we go. <laughs> must we? Um, the beginning of that sentence is something like. Must we accept the view of Protagoras that to the to the man who shivers it is cold, but him who does not, it is not cold? Well, that is probable. Then it also seems so to each of them. Yes. And this word seems is perceiving. It is so. Then fancy and perception are the same, at least in feelings of heat and all sensations of that kind. For just as each person feels them, such as it seems, they are to each. Likely enough. Then perception must always be of something that exists, and it cannot be mistaken since it is exact science. It seems so. Then, in the name of all that is elegant and refined, was not Protagoras a truly wise man when he gave us who are but the rabble multitude, a mere hint of this beautiful doctrine, but told his disciples the whole truth under the seal of secrecy? In what sense do you say this, Socrates? I will tell you a doctrine of no commonplace kind. Nothing exists singly and by itself, and you cannot rightly call anything of itself by any name, but if you speak of it as great, it will seem under other conditions to be small, if heavy, also light, and so with everything else, on the ground of there being no single existence, either as a thing or as a quality, the things we now speak of as existing, using thereby an incorrect expression, are really produced from change of position and motion and union of one with another. For nothing ever 
is, it is ever being produced. On this point, all philosophers ranged together. Parmenides accepted. Agree. Protagoras following Heraclitus and M oh, I got this. Empedocles, as well as <laughs> as well as the great composers of each kind of poetry. Epicharmus of comedy, Homer of tragedy. For Homer, in saying ocean from whom the gods were created, and Tethys, their mother has in effect declared that all things are produced from flux and movement. Does he not seem to you to mean this? He does. Then no As one. Aside. What? As an aside, he's talking particle physics, folks. <laughs> That's your line. No. <laughs> yeah, that was my line. <laughs> Wow, it's just showing some aristocratic mindset by creating on the spot new things. Yeah, right. Yeah, he's really leading the discussion in an interesting uh, um, direction, that's for sure. Yeah. Go, Socrates. Yes, he does. He does mean that. So then, no one surely in joining issue with so numerous a host with Homer for their leader can hope to escape ridicule. It would not be easy, Socrates. No, indeed, Thetatus. For the following facts are sufficient proofs of the proposition that what seems to exist but is really production is caused by motion and non-existence or dissolution by rest. Heat and fire, which, as we all know, both generates and rears everything else, is itself produced from motion and friction. And this is a kind of movement are not these the processes by which fire is kindled? I asked you a question. Certainly they are. <laughs> but surely also animals of all kinds are generated by the same processes? Uh, of course they are. Well, is not the condition of all living bodies impaired by quietness and inactivity? but kept up for long by exercises and movements? Certainly. And surely it is by learning and practice, which are stirrings of the mind, that the habit formed in the soul both acquires new information and retains it and becomes improved, while by lying by, which is non-practice and non-learning, it not only does not learn anything, but even forgets what it has learned? Assuredly so. Then the one of these, motion, is a good in respect to both body and soul, and the other is the contrary? It seems so. Need I then further speak of lulls and calms and things of that kind, and say that states of rest sap and destroy, while the contrary conditions preserve? And besides these, as the final argument, Shall I leave you no escape in bringing you over to my view, but assert that Homer means nothing else by his golden chain than the sun? In a word that he means to show that so long as the revolving motion of the heaven is kept up and the sun, all things are maintained in their existence, both among gods and men. Whereas if this were to come to a stand, as if bound fast, all things would come to ruin, and there would ensue. What is described by the proverb, all topsy-turvy. To me, Socrates, Homer does seem to express just what you say. Then, my excellent friend, view the matter in this light. First, with respect to sight, that's what, that which you call white does not exist, per se, as something external to your eyes, nor is it in your eyes. Do not, therefore, assign any place to it at all. For it would at once be in existence if it were somewhere in position, and it would be permanent and not always in course of being produced. Then how should I speak of it? Let us follow our late argument and assume that nothing exists as a one by itself. Thus, black and white and any other color you please will be found to be produced by the eye being directed to the object with the kind of motion that suits that organ. 
And thus, what we call color of any kind will not be the object that strikes, nor the eye that is struck, but an intermediate effect brought into existence for the particular person at the time. Or you would insist that what seems any color to you is also the same to a dog or to any creature. Or would you insist is the same to a dog or any creature? Indeed, I would not. Well... Does anything seem the same to another man as it does to you? Are you quite sure of this, or is it not much rather the case that it does not seem the same even to yourself through your never being in precisely the same bodily condition? This seems to me to be the case rather than that. Then if any object by which we compare our own stature or which we lay hold of were really great or really hot, it would not, by comparison with another thing, become different. That is, of course, so long as it admitted no change in itself. And again, if that which measures itself or which touches something else had possessed any of these qualities absolutely, it never would have become different if another object had been brought to it or in some way altered, while the original object remained unchanged. As we now use terms, my friend, my friends, we are compelled in a careless, easy way to say what is not only surprising, but ridiculous, as Protagoras would assert. And anyone who essays to use the same course of reasoning that he does. Now, what but, may I interrupt you? Yes. May I interrupt you? Okay. Uh, I would say that what has been read maybe for the last 10 minutes and what will be read re in the next 10 minutes, it's at the core of epistemology, okay? Because uh, by uh, talking uh, playfully, uh, Socrates is saying that, well, you're talking about perception, but uh, is it the perception of a human being, of a dog, of a cat, of a goat? So he introduced the fact that there is a body that is uh, 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 that participates but in part in that representation, okay? So the technical word that we use in Greek, but has many layers corresponding to the six layers of the epistemological journey, it's semion, S-E-M-A-I-O-N, and semion uh, uh, has the meaning of to mean something precisely, okay? And it's in the discovery of that semion that, uh, uh, that is about those uh, paragraphs, because, uh, true knowledge can be, uh, uh, you remember that he was talking when talking of Homer, of the stirrings of the mind, okay? And let's not forget that each time that we have the word mind, we have to understand which layers, mm. which of the six mm. layers of the mind, okay? So uh, the, the word semion in English can be uh, translated in many layers. Is it sense perception, understanding, intention, learning? knowledge, true knowledge, belief, consensual belief, or representation, okay? So maybe if I have to choose one word for semion, it's representation, because he was talking about the dog or other animals and human beings receiving something that is perceived as color. And let's not forget also the link with the dialogue, Cratylus, okay? The word color with its meaning, what is it? Okay, how is it created in that uh, representation? Okay, what is it, and how is it, how is it uh, uh, in reality, in phenomenal reality, by a human representation, and in what sense the relation between that human representation and the phenomenon would be called knowledge or true knowledge? Okay, the rest of the dialogue is about that core problem. And never forget that uh, thing always about the six layers, okay? Because uh, uh, the, the question is, what is knowledge precisely? And what is the layers uh, involved in a certain representation of phenomenal reality? Hmm. Very good. I, I would just add to one thing that I find really interesting is the allusion to the, uh, the fact that Socrates intuits, and I think he knows politically that, the, you know, Protagoras is in real life playing a certain role in a very destructive sense in the world that that Plato is is living in. Um, 
that P Protagoras must have some secret teachings. And Theotetus is like, what do you mean secret teachings? Well, if he's a radical empiricist who's saying that truth is basically equivalent to sense perception, well, he must also recognize that there's a flaw there anyway, because your sense perception, whether something that is sensed as heat or, or whiteness or whatever the senses pick up is relative to the context, which he also all acknowledges is true. So he, he is sort of alluding to the, the he, he's giving the game away for what was done again and again over the centuries in terms of creating a situation where people on the one hand become radical sensualists and purists, and then all create um, a, pol a, a, a polarization where they then become um, something else, <laughs> which yeah. uh, is gotten through secret doctrines, you know, for a, a, a special mm -hmm. little inner click. So uh, yeah. I just find that all an interesting illusion. And let's not forget that when Protagoras said that the man, man is the measure of all things, we have to guess that he meant a certain man as the yeah. measure of all things. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Hence, get, gets us back to the Yuval Harari uh, uh, <laughs> reference. <laughs> yes. Yep. Uh, uh, Susie, what was your... Uh... That word also, Quan. Can you type it in the chat? I think you said semion. Yeah, semion. Yeah, semion. I won't. I won't write it. Um, I just get a really strong feeling from I don't know this last paragraph or so. We have such a responsibility to hold carefully the wisdom that we gain and to express carefully to those around us. It's such a precious and valuable thing that just should not be polluted by ignorance or hastiness or arrogance. Mm -hmm. mm. Yup. All righty. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll kick off. How, what reasoning do you mean? Take a small matter as an example, and you will understand my meaning fully. Suppose you place four dice near to six others. Then, of course, we may say six are more than four, and half as many again. But if you put 12 dice, then six are fewer, and only half the number. And we are obliged to use this language. Would you for a moment allow any other? Not I, indeed. Well, now, if Protagoras should ask you, or anyone else, can a thing, Theotetus, possibly become greater or more in any other way than by increase, what answer will you give? Matthew, right. help us out here. All right. Why, Socrates, if I answer what I think in reference to the question just put, I should say it is not possible. But if in reference to the former question about the dice, then guarding my reply against contradiction, I should say it is possible. By Hera, a clever and oracular answer, my friend. But it seems to me that if you say it is possible, a case will occur like that in the play of Euripides, your language will be consistent, but your mind will still be open to conviction. True. Then if you and I were clever and wise and had investigated all the phenomena in psychology, we might now, and for the rest of the argument, by way of pastime, try each other's prowess by engaging, like sophists, in a contest of this kind and parry statement by statement. But as we are not sophists, but ordinary men, we will endeavor first to get a clearer view of the facts themselves and what meaning we attach to them, whether we find they can be reconciled with one another or not at all. Indeed, that is precisely what I should myself desire. And so should I. And this being the case, shall we not quiet at our leisure as having plenty of time at our disposal, again, reconsider the matter, not in a spirit of peevishness, but really to put our own convictions to the test and find out 
what these visionary notions in us are. In looking at the first, we shall say, I suppose nothing ever, nothing can ever become greater or less, either in bulk or in number, so long as it retains its own size. Is it not so? It is. The second proposition is, what has nothing added to it and nothing taken away, neither increases nor diminishes, but is always the same in size? Undoubtedly. Is there not then yet one more case? What was not before, but afterwards is, must have become so and undergone a process of becoming. I should think that is true. Well, now, these three propositions, as accepted by us, are at variance with each other in our minds. When we bring forward the case of the dice, or when we say that I, who am of a certain stature, without having grown or become less, in one year am first taller than you who were young, and then shorter. Without my proper height having had anything taken off it, but simply because you have grown. For I am afterwards what before I was not, without having become so. For without becoming, it is impossible to have become. And if I lost nothing of my bulk, I could never have gone through the process of becoming less. There are countless other cases of the same kind. If I suppose we are to accept these views. You follow me, I think, Theotetus? You seem indeed to be very well versed in such inquiries. I protest, Socrates. I, I am filled with exceeding wonder at these conclusions. And sometimes when I look steadily at them, I seem to reel as if darkness were coming over my sight. <sighs> Theodore, my friend, seems to have made a fair guess at your disposition. This feeling of wonder is very characteristic of your philosopher. Indeed, that and nothing but that is the source of all philosophy. And the poet who said that Iris was the daughter of Thaumas seems to have been an, an adept in genealogy. But do you now begin to see why those things are so from the doctrines we attribute to Protagoras, or are you still in doubt? Uh, I don't quite see it as yet. Will you thank me then if I help you to investigate the true meaning, concealed as it is from the many of the views held by a man or rather by men of note? Of course I shall thank you, and very heartily too. <clears throat> Look round you in every direction lest some of the uninitiated should overhear us. These are the people who do not believe in the existence of anything but what they can clutch in their hands and do not admit in the category of being natural operations or creations or any unseen agency. In truth, Socrates, they are a hard and unimpressible set that you speak of. They are indeed, my son, an illiterate lot. But there are others, much more subtle in language, whose mystical doctrines I am about to describe, and the leading principle on which all the theories we have just mentioned depend is this, that motion is everything, and beside that nothing else is. Of this motion, there are two kinds, each infinite in its manifestations, the one having the faculty of acting, the other of being acted upon. Well, from the union and close contact of these with each other, offspring is produced, also infinite in its number of forms, but again of two kinds, one the sensible, the other sense. That is a power of perception, which always is produced along with the object of sense and is born at the same instant with it. Now, the senses we express by such terms as these, we call them acts of seeing, hearing, smelling, besides feeling of cold or heat, even the emotions of pleasure and pain or desire and fear. And though there are endless varieties of these which have no names at all, yet those which have names are very numerous. Now, 
the class of phenomena which we speak of as objects of sense are produced simultaneously with each of the senses. Colors of all kinds for different sorts of eyesight. And in, the same, and, in, and in the same way, sounds for hearing and the other sensuous effects that are produced by a simultaneous birth with the other senses. Now, what has this story to do with our former inquiries? Do you understand? I can't say that I do, Socrates. <laughs> then attend, and we will see if we can arrive at a conclusion. Uh, here, uh, sorry, uh, here is the is the Platonic answer to the Parmenides paradox. Okay, uh, can we take two, three minutes to discuss the Parmenides paradox? I would like to hear from you what you think about the Parmenides paradox. Okay, and the key, the two key words here are senses and motion. Well, there are three key words or four. Senses motions and unseen agency okay and those three four words are from the two three pages we just read well i i want to comment it's I, I doubt it's an answer to your to your question in that preceding paragraph the idea of sensations being produced simultaneously with senses really shined a light on a lot of thinking I've done about energy. Did it burst into existence at the big bang? How did consciousness arise? How did the, you know, the organs of consciousness and perception arise? But most importantly, the idea that what we call energy, if it is a, 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 a something that quote unquote burst into existence which ain't necessarily so it could be argued that what it has done if it has become us and everything in the universe i love the idea that it is because its essence was the intention and the ability to exist so it's that life force that has just blossomed and become more and more conscious as we are here and that wherever our intention goes we would create the extensions and the senses and the organs necessary to fulfill whatever our intentions might be. Hmm. Hmm. I would say it's part of the answer of the Parmenides paradox, but uh, before I give my little speech, I would like to hear from other. But Quan, will you, will you describe what um, the, the Parmenides paradox is? Yes. As far as uh, the oh. Yes. Okay, so you have uh, three philosophers that are in contention here, okay? Uh, Parmenides was around 65 years old when Socrates was a young lad of 20 years old, okay, to give you a chronological idea. And Heraclitus, the, the second one, is about the same generation as Parmenides, and Socrates, as all of you know, 469 BCE to 399 BC. Okay. And of course, his uh, brilliant student, uh, Plato, uh, 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 427 to 347 BC. So it's not three philosophers in, in interaction here, but rather four, okay? For Parmenides, only being is, okay? And so everything that we see, that we call the phenomenal reality, everything that is born, grow, and die one day, for Parmenides are hallucinations. So to maintain his first proposition that only being is. And here we are related to the notion of unseen agency, okay? Because the last two paragraphs that we read is about that, okay? So that unseen agency is the unmoving and unchanging being according to Parmenides. Or if you want, because Parmenides has been treated very unfairly by history for me. Because for, for me, Parmenides gave the Platonic solution, but for unknown reason, he was not capable to explain it as clearly as Plato. And I would say that 
it's only fair that we attribute the explanation to the one having given the clearest explanation, Plato. But for Parmenides, what is called in this Theotetus dialogue as unseeing agency is the unmoving and unchanging being, okay? The three timeless form of beauty, goodness, and truth. And for Heraclitus, the second uh, notion of the, the, the last two, three paragraphs is everything is in flux, okay? The notion of motion. So how to reconcile that everything phenomenally is in motion, but at the same time only being is. And here we come with the platonic answer of the six layers of the mind. So in the level of senses, perception, intellect and psyche, everything is moving or in flux. But in the unseeing agency, as the, uh, Socrates said in that dialogue, you have the three timeless form of beauty, goodness, and truth, or to use a Larousse terminology or a phrase, substance is efficient cause and efficient cause is substance, okay? So, that is the core of the Parmenides paradox, a dialogue in time or in timeless dimension between Parmenides, Heraclitus, Socrates, and Plato. And as I said, history has been a little bit unfair to Parmenides because he already gave the solution, but Plato offers something that is much more understandable in the chapter seven of the Republic and in the in the the present uh, trilogy that um, we read, the first one about uh, episteme. Hmm. Two questions. Number one, did, is there any work, written works of Parmenides that survive or is it? Yes, yeah. there's a, yes, there is a poem about being. Ah. And the first line precisely that only being exists, nothing else exists, and being is unchanging and non-moving, okay? And the rest of the poems, uh, why I said that history has been unfair to him, because in the rest of the poem, he wouldn't, he wouldn't give the Platonic solution, but not in a clear manner as Plato in the dialogue of the Republic, especially in the seventh chapter, and not as clear as in the trilogy, Theotetus, the Sophist, and the Statement. Of course, intellectually, we have to give the, the laurels to the guy having given the best explanation, that's for sure. So could you say that you're, we're, I'm being, as I, I guess the word being, being, I'm witnessing, like I'm not changed, my being isn't changing, but I'm witnessing events through time and like motion and stuff like that? Yes. Would that, uh, would that be fair? Absolutely. Okay. That's the, the, the classical dialectics between being and doing. Okay. Uh, doing is in the, in the reality of, uh, in the phenomenal reality. Okay. Uh, time and timelessness. Right. Or, right now, I was just kind of thinking of witnessing you know, like through my eyes or my senses or whatever it is I have of changes going through, but my being isn't, it's just, it's just staying there. It's still there. Exactly. Exactly. And you can reach to that being in my personal experience, either through the Socratic dialogue, meaning that it's the method that is using more the intellect okay, but use in the right way, or you can reach it by meditation, which is more an oriental method if you want. But I would say that it's not important which method you use. You have to use one method to the end, okay? Either you go into meditation seriously, or either you go into Socratic dialogue seriously but you have to push one of the two that you would choose to the end and you will have the experience, okay? As I said, maybe half an hour ago, not as a revelation, but as a personal experience. And when you get it, well, you are an aristocratic man. Hmm. 
Hmm. And isn't isn't this aren't these just very very nice uh, ways of describing what others for eons have described as enlightenment, more or less? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. But I I try to avoid those things because yes. uh, it would associate us with the uh, hocus pocus. So I prefer to stay in the Platonic uh, line. Hocus pocus. Okay. No, but well, uh, once again, I'm an, an admirer of the Buddhist Abhidharma, but the way that it has been presented in the West by the postmodern movement. Hmm. Uh, it was a pure disaster. So I don't want sure. to associate myself sure. with those stuff sure. in the West. Yeah. If I yeah. if I was speaking with Indian or Chinese, I would talk about the Buddhist Ab Ab Abhidharma because they have the intellectual preparation to to talk of those things seriously. But in the West, I prefer to to stick myself to Plato and to the Socratic Socratic dialogues hmm. method. Come on, I, I oh sorry, yeah, after you, man. Okay, I, I, my question was just in pushing, um, you, you're obviously a very advanced meditator. You, you've, you've convinced me of that, but also you're an advanced platonic thinker. You've convinced me of that too. So would you say that when pushing in one domain, you become more equipped to also uh, express yourself or at least uh, uh, move in the other domain, whether in, in or, or how are yes. you thinking about that? I, I think that, in the West, it is. Um, I think that in the West, it's, it's more systematic, okay? In the sense that when Plato said that there is no philosopher who is not also a, a geometer, uh, I think that it's there, the difference between the West and the East. Uh, in the East, you have the meditative practices that can propel you in the timeless dimension without you being a geometer. But in the West, you have to be a Jumiter to go into timelessness because of the difference of mentality. Mm. So I think that it's better for a Westerner to stick to the Socratic method. You, you can learn about meditation, okay? But in my own experience, and maybe because the, the, the meditation stuff has been introduced by not true enlightened people, but by uh, agents of the oligarchy in the West, uh, it's more like a caricature. So uh, I think that it's better for the Westerner to keep on with the Socratic dialogues because I would say that in the West, what they understand as meditation, I don't want to be pretentious, but I would equate them to relaxation techniques, okay? And relaxation techniques are not the Buddhist, are the Abhidharma, okay? Abhidharma means uh, the deep philosophical epistemological pathway, okay? So, uh, of course, you can be curious and read about Buddhist epi epistemology. It's not, it's not wrong. But if you, I think that for a Westerner, it's, be it's better to go to geometry, to mathematics, but to remember that geometry and mathematics is only the first level of the big kingdom called beauty. So you have to add poetry, literature, philosophy, architecture, paintings, and so on. So you would be propelled to goodness and truth. Thank you. There was a, another thing I got out of this a uh, little bit earlier. Um, we were talking about ideas and thoughts. And, and I thought of, um, you know, you teach... Here we we're we're being taught like you know beauty and um, truth. What is it? Truth, goodness, and beauty. And you have if if you keep your thoughts beautiful, true, uh, true, and and all that. To, um, these thoughts and ideas that you have, and then you converse with other people with those same thoughts. You can give birth to new and yeah to brand new. Um, thoughts and ideas through those other thoughts that you originally had, like in a mm. almost like in a generational thing, and because and because they originated from this truth and beauty, um, the new thoughts together would be uh, honorable and and good. 
I don't know where I'm going with this, but uh, it kind of it kind of can give birth to new thoughts. Exact to give birth to new thoughts. Okay, in the sense that if you are in the timeless domain, uh, you can have spaces in your mind, and those spaces will make you less impressed by the shenanigans of the oligarchy of the fake democratic man. And because you are less impressed and less intimidated by them, you will be capable to have the mindset of the aristocratic man, meaning playful exploration. Because let's not forget, it's all a question of superior emotions, okay? Uh, we, uh, it's part precisely of the postmodernist uh, disaster than to, um, how can I say it, to promote the inferior emotions like uh, uh, envy, jealousy, anger, lust, greed, okay? But what has been forgotten is that you have superior emotions and superior emotion can, uh, I would like to understand things, okay? A certain aspiration, a certain enthusiasm, okay? Let's not forget that that, that, that impulse is not intellectual, it's emotional. And precisely the core of the aristocratic man's playful exploration is the superior emotion called agape. Okay, agape, agape love, but love for others, of course, but also love for being the person capable to have a sovereign mind, love for your own human conditions. Okay, it's very contrary to the uh, postmodernist attitude of uh, despair, there is no future, uh, blah, 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 okay, all that bullshit, okay? Uh, agape is the perfect, absolute, polar opposite to that uh, postmodernist post -modernist, uh, posture of uh, fake, of despair, of uh, uh, indifference, okay? Because it's precisely enthusiasm and love for your human mind, your po your potential of having a sovereign mind, and your capacity to have an aristocratic attitude, meaning a playful, explorative attitude, or what I call Kasim, okay? Cognitive actions of the sovereign investigative mind. Mm. Nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, look, there's just so much to this. I, I I can't help throughout a lot of the readings that we've just had. I I find my mind wandering into references to do with contemporary science and metaphysics and uh, ideas like that. You know, when we talk about being as, let's say, fundamental, then, um, you know, looking at uh, my mind immediately runs to ideas of, um, you know, the fabric of the universe as it's being uh, um, looked at in science, things like holographic notions and stuff like that. There are all sorts of links. And of course, the interesting part about it is my mind's thinking in terms of um, the contemporary culture that I'm a part of, whereas I'm reading writings of people who, for example, Bruce have never heard of the Big Bang Theory. And yet the references are there in the writing. I just can't help, you know, my mind sort of leads me off in that direction, not, not in huge ways, but there are just these references that keep popping in. There's a lot in it, in other words. There really is a lot in it. There's the surface meaning as we keep referencing, and then there's the deeper meaning as Quan is reminding us of. Absolutely. It's not for nothing that I said that you have to read only two Platonic dialogues. It would be the Republic and the Theatetis. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there's so much. There's so many layers. It's wonderful uh, that just give it's food for the mind uh, that just replenishes itself. I must have read this several times and, and I, I could say each time is, is incomparable to the previous reading and even now i mean there's so many obviously kwan you're you're helping this uh, birthing process along but there's so many new thoughts that are emerging um it, it just it's like the gift that keeps on giving you know yeah, look and, and, and i i have to chime in again i mean part of my reference to you know viewing it from a contemporary point of view um you can't get away from the fact that what we're dealing with here is the same ideas that what's being referenced in the article we're making that rebirthing connection, if you like, to, to sources of knowledge that take us back thousands of years. There's that connection, that feeling that what we're exploring, you know, generation after generation after generation is in some 
respects repetitive. We're dealing with the same ideas. Mm -hmm. But, you know, over time, generationally, you know, things change. We come to understand it a little bit differently in uh, a lot of ways, scientifically as well as emotionally. I just wanted to I, say something as a bit of a side <coughs> note to anything uh, philosophical, um, which was that um, the performance today from both of you, because I've I've been a part of several readings now of the Theotetus and uh, the way that uh, Bruce, you read Socrates was in a, in a way that I have not heard Socrates voice, but I think that there was a lot of uh, appropriateness in like what you were stressing, uh, stressing that I, I didn't quite, you know, think of Socrates in this way in my imagination in, in having these discussions with people and it's very much like Shakespeare um you know John Barton he's a he's a very famous director of the Royal Shakespeare Company and he would you know he was known for for being a really good director but he would give the actors their space because every actor will come at it a little bit differently but there's there's a there's there's something um that is uh you know that everyone can learn from with like a new person coming in and and mm -hmm. reading the part and so i really enjoyed tonight's reading just on that note of like it being a play mm -hmm. in of itself mm -hmm. well yeah, I, kudos I would... to you bruce kudos to you bruce uh, especially i mean i'm giving one-liners all the time but <laughs> trying to stay relevant <laughs> relevant to the conversation and your ability to play the role of socrates here has made it so easy to stay a part of the conversation as we're reading it so congratulations yeah i agree i agree because uh, and i'm very happy because uh, theocytus has to be rendered like that okay mm. in the sense that in uh, it's alive it's something at the core of our life and it's not academic it's truly uh, what the three big words that i use is truly myurics hermeneutics and and theory so, of knowledge okay yeah. meaning it's the way okay the chinese in me is coming back the way with the cap capital w or the epistemological growth that you can go to absolute reality to the sun of the absolute but as a playful adventure and not mm -hmm. as something boring and imposed upon you because mm -hmm. in the general population unhappily platonic dialogues are perceived as stuff for old teachers or professors uh very close very elitist and it's not the case at all in reality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bruce, in, in this if, case, in this case particularly, Bruce, the, the, there were times where the sense of humor came across so strongly. I mean, the playfulness that Quan is referring to here, you know, for you as a radio broadcaster, I don't know how natural that is, but it really was natural. Yeah. You know, in, in the appropriate and relevant sections of the reading where it was, you know, you, you sense that it was being said in a kind of playful way, it, it really pushed the conversation further because of that. I, I would just add to this because we, we were talking about the being and the becoming both coexistent realms, right? Mm -hmm. And sense, sense perception and the senses, uh, which, you know, you can see obviously the parallels, right? You can never see sight, you can never hear hearing, but you could he see things, you could see color, you could hear sounds, um, and, and they, they coexist in this very, very dynamic, dynamic way. And just like this text, you know, I you could we could reread this thousands of times with different people or the same people and not necessarily ever produce it in the exact same way. But then why can some people read it in the wrong way? Right. Like because sometimes you hear a platonic dialogue and it's just read wrong. You're like, no, this person does not beat to the essence, the essence of Socrates's intention, his humor, his his that that character yeah. that makes him was not present in the heart of the reader of that dead bland text whereas you guys both were able to sort of you could i could feel it you know like you mm. you tapped into the general spark of what what animated the person of plato through the voice of socrates um mm. and it worked it worked so damn well it's very rare um, it was like it was like bruce was socrates yeah. i mean it was yeah. really like that he was like socrates it was fantastic it was like he came right from his mind like you know it wasn't like you were reading it was great yeah it's a test i think each person that plays the part brings something of their own 
spirit and soul into the experience that helps to bring out facets of the original for us all to experience. And you cannot get that from dead, dry intellect. That comes mm -hmm. from the heart really being engaged in the dialogue. I got paid. <laughs> yeah, I got paid because that is the energy of meta representation. Okay, because I am again go coming back to my little pedantic side. When you were speaking of perceptions or sense of perception or, per or senses, it's the representation. And you have that representation because you have a human body, okay? Socrates was speaking, would you have the same image or the same sound as you were a dog or a goat or anything else than a human or having a human body? In, that is semion, okay? What I call, what I talked uh, an hour ago, the mental representation. But if you stay stuck to that mental representation, you only have the animal mind. You need to be uplifted to meta representation. And meta is a Greek word meaning after, okay? Or above the representation. And precisely the energy that is produced in our interaction in our little group is agape, okay? That excitement, that curiosity, mm -hmm. that playfulness, and that is precisely that energy that is uplifting us to the aristocratic level, meaning that the, the, the agapic love, which is the energy that gives you the capacity to have a meta representation of the representation that is given by your animal mind. Mm. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Here, here. Mm. Thank you, Matt and Cynthia. Thank you, Kwan Lee. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Paul. This has been a beautiful experience. Yeah, it's been fun today. Yeah. If this yeah. is what it's going to be week after week for the next few weeks, Kwan, um, I'll certainly be here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I hope because I don't want to lose our theatre. The yeah. 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 And I hope that Socrates will come back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we need them. <laughs> that was good. I really enjoyed it. Are we continuing oh, well. next week, like where we left off? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah just yeah. just keep mind in case somebody forgets. Uh, it's page. Um... Yes, it's page twenty nine. There you go. Really, page yeah. twenty nine. That's it. No way. Really? Yeah, I, I downloaded the version that you that you chose uh, rather than my version, yeah. so it's the same version. I'll make an effort between now and uh, next week to read a little bit further on. Oh, that, uh, that, same, that same version, yeah. I mean, I started yeah. reading it today. As I said, it was only the introduction that I read through just as a way of getting the mind ready for what we were going to do. But now that we've read some of the dialogue, I'm keen to read as much of it as I can. Years yeah. ago, years ago, I, I probably read this. <laughs> I know I read The Republic and other things. And there was so much hope in the the passages about things are produced by motion it makes it an eternal you know brand new fresh start every moment so much hope and um about 30 years ago i stopped pursuing my acting career and i've done none of it really since and with with material like this to read and such you know and feeling so safe among you guys for the last many many weeks you know I'm going to be up till dawn. I'm not going to sleep tonight because this just was more fun than a barrel of monkeys. <laughs> cool. And I'll yeah. see you next. I'll see you next week. All right. Yeah. Look Until forward next to week. it. Okay. Ciao, everyone. Okay. See you soon. Yeah. Great. Good night. Night all. Yeah. Good night, everyone. <laughs>